For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I want to reflect a little bit on that uh, truth about our Lord by asking you this. Imagine with me how you would feel if someone came along and said that they would pay for the down payment of a house that you were interested in so that you could buy it. How would you feel? I mean, in this housing market, probably elated. But, uh, you know, you're, you'd probably be doing the math in your head. How much would that be? What, you know, what can we afford? What would the monthly payments be like afterwards? Uh, we did something similar, and by, I'm, by we, I mean my wife and myself. Um, we did something similar, but stretched out over time. So it wasn't all at once because we don't have a budget like that. Um, but we, we wanted to try to make a dent in housing justice, for, especially for black and brown folks, friends of ours in our community in Dorchester. We bought our triple-decker house in Boston in the year 2000. It's one of those no-frills, boxy houses that were built originally for lower-income Irish families in the early 20th century. At the time, it cost $245,000, which, which sounds amazingly low these days. <clears throat> Our mortgage was about $2,000 a month. Uh, we talked to a lot of uh, old friends and new friends and invited a bunch of them, all fellow followers of Jesus, to live with us in this house, to be a big family together in what is called an intentional Christian community. We charged below market rent uh, so that many of them could be teachers, work for nonprofit organizations, and, and have a real, but yet have a really rich life. And, <clears throat> um, and in, the, in the process, we, we all invested in getting to know our neighbors and uh, building a sense of community in our neighborhood. I want to tell you a little bit about one of our first housemates. Her name is Leslie Moore. She is an amazing black woman who loves Jesus. She hailed from Blythe, California. She went to Yale University, and uh, she worked with youth and young adults in educational programs and outreach. She lived with us for a total of eight years where she paid between $100 to $200 a month in rent. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's ridiculous. Like, where can you find that now? And that means she, she did that because she always, she loved having roommates, and we didn't charge by the floor. We, tr we just charged by the room, and, and so it, it incentivized all of us to, um, to actually have roommates. <clears throat> that means she saved a lot. And after about eight years, she bought a, she started buying property of her own. Like she bought a triple decker house down the street where she started the traction program where young people can make traction towards their goals. Folks who needed to earn their GRE or get their college degree or uh, build a stable life and career. So <clears throat> she leveraged the equity in that house later and eventually bought three more <laughs> houses. Then she bought a former Catholic rectory in Central Falls, Rhode Island, which, she, which has like almost 20 rooms. She uses that to house people in Christian community and even hold retreats and mini conferences for church groups. She bought a small mall a few years ago in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. And now she is helping launch black and brown folks who are entrepreneurs in business, and you should totally go and have the empanadas. And, and she is hoping to partner with others and make that section of downtown Pawtucket a black block. Now, uh, some of this, it, I just, <laughs> some of the, I, I, by the way, I feel very privileged to share stories like this um, I, I'm representing a lot of people. 
in sharing these stories uh, and giving you kind of a narrow slice. And my wife and I have got to play a small part in this. <clears throat> but I, I do want to address one feeling that you might be having, which is that sounds weird. We don't hear stories like that. Why is that? In fact, depending on who you are, it might sound unbelievable. Really? You use your house like that? See, and, and why is that? Because in our wider American culture, we use our house as our private castle. It's our getaway from everyone else, <clears throat> especially for the nuclear family. So you live in community? Isn't that for hippies from the 1970s? <laughs> or we th in, in the U.S., we think of a house as a reward for good behavior. And in some places, whether there's a physically gated community or a financially gated community, you have to prove to us that you deserve to live around here. And that is part of a legacy of housing discrimination and segregation that is one of the dominant features of U.S. history. Just look at the Color of Wealth report that came out in 2015 about family wealth in the greater Boston area. The median white family has about $250,000. The median black family has $8, right? The major difference is housing. And all of the subtle and not so subtle policies that have stood in the way of home ownership, debt reduction, and asset building for many people. Why? And, and yet, you know, these kinds of policies, which are exploitative, like the housing market, because of its connection to finance and banking, has always been a little exploitative. And we've started to see that balloon and start to affect more and more of us, especially in the 2008 Great Recession, that banks had long exploited people's desire for a home, a stable neighborhood, stable schools, uh, you know, something to give your children when you pass on. And now, instead, we see people paying super high rents, um, private equity firms buying up, you know, single-family homes, and people living in tent cities, or just on the street at Mass and Cass, right down where the 93 connects to Boston. Those all reflect different aspects of the same problem, which is that our system runs on exploitation. It is not a gift economy. It is, it is not a jubilee economy. It's an exploitative economy. And by contrast, God has a type of housing first policy. He treats housing, at least some housing, as part of a gift economy, not even as part of a merit economy or, and definitely not an exploitative economy, meaning God keeps trying to gift us with homes. God keeps trying to gift us with community. Sorry. And there, there are four passages of Scripture that I want to quickly go through to give us something to reflect on and circle back to as we think about God's jubilee pattern of gifting us with land, of community, with safety, with health. <clears throat> so first, Genesis 1 and 2. It's the creation story and the Garden of Eden story. God makes the whole planet. He, he puts his image bearers there. Have we done anything to deserve it? No. In fact, the Garden of Eden is this special home where God protects, protected Adam and Eve. There was special beauty there that was distinct from the rest of the wild creation. Right? It's, I imagine it may have been something that looks like this. <clears throat> and basically, God said, these four riverways that flow down from Mount Eden are roadways, they're pathways for you to spread the beauty and order and protection of this garden throughout the wild creation. Go and tame it and gift it to your children. And by doing so, Adam and Eve would have been like God. 
God gave a garden to his children, so Adam and Eve would have given a garden to their children. It would have been like Lothlorien or Rivendell in The Lord of the Rings. They, they would pay it forward, right? And that is a gift. It's a, it, it's a type of jubilee. <clears throat> and even though Adam and Eve fell into sin and corrupted human nature and lost the special protection of the garden, of that garden, God still called them to bear human life and garden life and partnered with them, even though there would be sorrow mixed in with their experience. The next important scripture is Leviticus 25. God brought the people of Israel out of Egypt and into a new garden land. You see how God keeps trying to win partners in gardening? Now, I'm going to take you out of, out, of that, out of that place, out of slavery, and deliver you into a beautiful land, and we'll garden it together. And every 50 years, God pressed a button called the Jubilee Year because God wanted to re-gift the garden land as if he was bringing Israel into the land for the very first time. Israel was supposed to be a partial restoration of what Adam and Eve and all humanity could have experienced. It it could have been something like this. And if your parents or grandparents had suffered from famine and had to leave, or maybe they were flaky and they lost their land on a wild bet, you would get the land back. That was the Jubilee year. Every 50 years, God pressed that button and the land went back to the the original family boundaries. And so contrast that with American culture and our laws, and our institutions. We allow our children and grandchildren to inherit all of the advantages and disadvantages that we could possibly pass on, leading to generational inequality. God said, nope, every 50 years, I I get to claim all of you as my kids. You're all my kids. I get to interrupt. I get to break into every family and claim all of you equally as my kids. I get to re-gift the garden land to all of you. doesn't matter what you want to or able are able or not able to gift to your children because I re-gift it. That's the jubilee. Hang on to that picture because in the, the two New Testament passages, which I'll quickly touch on, Jesus says, everyone who follows me will have homes and farms and families, right? Matthew 19, Mark 10, in this age and in the age to come. And so lose your life for me and you will find it. My kingdom community will be a new community full of generosity and hospitality and sharing. Did he mean it? And the last passage would be Paul in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, where he says, remember Jesus? That one, the Lord who became poor for our sake, that we might be made rich through him. What did he mean by that? Well, a lot of things, but economic health was actually one of them. I mean, later on in that chapter, in 2 Corinthians 8, verse 15, he says that there may be equality. And he's talking about economic equalities. Paul is talking to the Corinthians about making a financial contribution to the Jerusalem Christians and Judean Christians who they have never met, They who they realize, oh, we're part of the same spiritual family now, but they're suffering from a famine, so we're going to make a financial contribution that there may be equality. And it's through the church and by that, that God is restoring this sense of what he envisioned for all humanity. As Jesus 
heals human nature in himself through his baptism and wilderness temptation and then through his death and resurrection and he goes down and comes back up cleansed and healed and he says, I have overcome the sin and selfishness and evil and death that, is, that has embedded itself into your humanity. I give myself to you as the solution to that. Well, then he restores to all, he restores God's vision for humanity. Not just, not just that we could run around with individually healed human natures, but relationships that are being healed. And God has always been interested in having partners in gardening. And that means a lot of things for us. That means we have to care about our own and other people's experience of the good creation. Are they having a good experience? Do they have a place that is nurturing, healthy, full of clean air and water? Or is it polluted? Is it destroying their health? Do we build homes that are life-giving or somehow made out of just terrible cheap materials that mold and make us sick? We have to care about housing justice, ecology, the environment, the way that people, that we as people experience the land. And I think that is a little challenging uh, for, for us in Boston and New England, partly because I, uh, although we live on some of the richest soil in the country, most of our wealth in the greater Boston area has come from trade. And so we're less connected to the land and the soil and the qualities that come from where we actually live. And the more that I explore this, the more intriguing it gets for me. One last story, and then I will pray, and, and then we will move on in our service. Um, one of the um, most touching things that, that my wife and I and our housemates have been able to do in our home is convert a vacant lot into a beautiful community garden. That vacant lot was right next door to our house. It was a trash dump. People left old car tires and broken bottles, drug paraphernalia in that vacant lot. Uh, we partnered with our neighbors and an organization, a few organizations. We got um, grants from the mayor's office for small neighborhood changes and things like that so we could convert that space into a beautiful community garden where there are vegetable beds so all the older folks that came up from the south can plant their beans and greens. We can plant our tomatoes and basil and other things because making pizza and your own spaghetti sauce from your own ingredients in your own garden is amazing. <clears throat> and then there's grassy space now. Uh, in, in past summers, we have set up a screen, speakers, and projection, and had family movie nights, a lot like this, where we, you know, play movies like Aquila and the Bee. And, you know, our neighbors and their kids would come out. And it was so fun. It took time, but and it took a lot of work. But eventually, there were enough people who, who started to feel like, you know, we really want to own and care for this space. We want to make sure that things, bad things aren't happening at night, right? So we want to, you know, set up a, a lock and things like that. So how do we do that together? How do we, and, and it led to community conversation and led to a monthly neighborhood meeting. And in our community, in our immediate neighborhood, that had always been a challenge because there are at least four different languages spoken. But it was a picture of God working to replant a garden right in our street and how that brought people together and the further conversation, the prayers, the conversations about Jesus that that led to. 
And I want to leave you with that picture because I think you have wonderful opportunities up here in the North Shore to do things like that. I mean, of course, not the same particular thing, but things like that. And I hope that, you know, in a few minutes, we could explore those things together, that you could share with me some of the things that you've heard, done. Uh, And I hope we can think and talk together and pray together about that to the glory of God in Jesus Christ. Let me pray for us, and then we will continue on here. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the beauty of this place and the beauty of your family, the beauty of each and every person and their lives and what you're doing in it. I pray that you would continue to walk alongside this community, Trinity North Shore, as they seek your face, as they seek the blessing of this community in which they live and the larger nation and world in which we live. We want your life, the beauty of your garden, the fruit of your spirit to be made manifest. So help us to walk with you, partner with you as you garden in our hearts and bring forth more and more fruitfulness. And as we also dig deep into this soil, care for it, seek your wisdom for it, and bring forth fruit and beauty and life and health for generations. Help us to acknowledge the sad things that have happened on this soil. Help us to hope and dream for better in Jesus' name. Amen.